Sometimes you're going to have to put your pride down. Don't you let pride ruin your life. Don't you let pride ruin the situation. Because if you stand on pride, the enemy will get the victory. Because you won't be where God's called you to be. Next, turn with me to Philippians 3 and 13. Philippians 3 and 13. Philippians 3 and 13. Philippians 3 and 13. Philippians 3 and 13 says, Brethren, I count my, not, not myself to be apprehended. I'll translate all of this. But this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. Put a pin in that. And then it says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I'll explain that. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. If you want to be successful, you have to have a bad memory. Let me say that again. If you want to be successful, you got to be able to forget the things that are behind you. Uh, this Sunday, we have Super Bowl Sunday coming up. And Tom Brady gets to stand as he's taking another team to the Super Bowl. Now, how is it that Tom Brady gets to stand up after getting dismissed from New England and coming to this new team? After being the last man picked when he was drafted? After being the lowest man when he was playing football at Michigan, he was the lowest quarterback. He was the one like, oh, man, put Tom, oh, Lord, put that big white boy, he's slow. Well, put him in, oh, Lord. But what Tom has is a short memory. See, the thing is, if he throws an interception, and ladies, an interception is something bad. If he throws an interception, he don't focus on the interception. He says, next play. Now, what does that mean for you and I? You're going to have some bad things that happen in your life, some disappointments. Some places where you let yourself down. Some places where you, you, you misstep or you did something that you're embarrassed about. What the Bible is saying, you got to forget yesterday and you got to reach for tomorrow. Because whatever happened yesterday, you cannot change. You can't go back, Jada, and change what you did on Sunday. You got to reach for for next Sunday. Because if you focus on what you did yesterday, you'll never get to the tomorrow that God has called you to be. you got to have a short memory. God says don't focus on the things that are bad. Don't focus on the things that are good. you got to focus on now and tomorrow. Because whatever happened yesterday, you can't change. You can't change what happened yesterday. Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching to those things that are before. Look at the next verse, verse 14. I press forward toward the mark of the prize for the high calling in Christ Jesus. I press forward toward the mark of the high calling of the prize in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? What is your prize? What is your prize? What, what are you working for? What are you thinking about? What goals do you have? See, the problem with a lot of you is you have no goals. And since you have no goals, you have nothing to work for. And so what happens is if you have no goals and nothing to work for, you just spin it around in a circle, just wasting time working at Amazon this week, work, working at Walmart this week, working at Target this week, working security this week, and you just doing all these different things and you have no goals. God says, I have a prize for you. But you can't get to the prize if you don't even realize that you have a prize. And that's what a lot of us do. We're just spinning in a circle, going around, round and around, round and around. And next thing you know, you're 30. And you got three kids and two baby daddies and two baby mamas. And you haven't got no father in life because you didn't realize that you're supposed to be working towards the prize. You need to recognize and identify what are your goals. 
Christ said, when I created you, I put a goal inside of your body. I put a goal inside of you. What are you working for? Are you just enjoying life? Are you just smoking weed and drinking and, and tattooing and having a lot of fun and not realizing that the clock is moving? Every second of life that you breathe is a second that you'll never get back. The clock never goes backwards. It always goes forward. The Bible says, redeem the time for the days are evil. What that means is, if you don't take advantage of this time, you'll never get it back. You'll never be 10 again. You'll never be 15 again. You'll never be 18 again. The clock is moving forward. What are you doing with your time? Do you have a goal? And if you have a goal, what is it? What are you working for? What, do you have anything that's, that's worthy? Or, or is your objective just to live and to exist? What are you working for? The Bible says, work towards the mark. Move toward the mark. Turn me next to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Turn up a little addition. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so, does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I'll translate all that. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand at the throne of God. Wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. Uh, what does that mean? It says, look at everybody around here, about 30, 40 people, 30, 40 people. In life, you're going to have an audience. You're going to have an audience. For some, it's going to be your family. For some, it's going to be social media. For some, it's going to be your community. For some, you YouTube famous. For some, it's your Instagram. You have an audience. You have people that are watching you all day. They watch you, especially now with this social media thing. They watch every move that you make. What are you doing in front of the crowd? because they're watching. Now, what's interesting about this is, it says that in this crowd, you have to run a race. What does that mean? Your life is a race. Your life is a race. Your life is a race from one point until the other point. See, the beginning point of your life is when you were born. The end point is when you die. But the point is, you got to run the course in between birth and death. Recently, I've been doing a lot of funerals. In fact, two weeks ago, I had to do three funerals in six days. And when I got to stand over the casket and I got to eulogize the, this body, I have to talk about what did they do along their course? What are you doing with your life? And what it says here is this. As you're running, you got to throw off the weight. Because what happens is, as you're running your race, Satan is running along with you. Satan is running right beside you. Satan is speaking into your ear. And what he does is temptations. He, he, dis, he distracts you with temptations. He sends people your way and cell phones and, and boyfriends and girlfriends who will take you astray and lead you down a dark path. You started off saying, I want to be a doctor. And now you're all the way down to a CNA. Because you follow somebody that didn't have anything good for you. You have to be careful when you're running your race because God has given you a prize. It's interesting in this audience, we have Jai, we have Bishop, and Jaim and Peter. They were all running backs or receivers for Compton High School. And so eventually, the, the quarterback would get the ball to them. And they have to hold that ball and they have to run with it. What I'm saying is this, you gotta hold your gift and you got to hold it close to you. 
Because if you're running through the line, Long Beach Polly is pulling at your gift. That's the devil. As you're running through that line, Centennial High School is pulling at your gift. That's the devil. As you're running through that line, Dominguez High School is pulling at your gift. That's the devil. See, Satan wants to take that gift. He wants to take that ball right out of your hands. And he wants to watch you fumble. And when you fumble, he's going to laugh at you. He's going to say failure. Failure. Ha ha. Didn't make it. Loser. Look at you. But what you need to know about Satan is this. The devil is a liar. Never listen to anybody who tries to put you down behind your mistakes. Because life is about mistakes. You're young people. You're going to make a whole lot of mistakes. That's called you. But here's what you do with your mistakes. Learn from them. Learn from your mistakes. And if you learn from your mistakes, you'll step differently next time you get to walk. But if you keep making the same mistake over and over and over again, it's because you ain't learned nothing. And that's what a lot of us do. Because we're so distracted. God is also running along with you. And he's whispering in your ear, not there. Don't step there. Don't make, this, make different decisions. Who are you listening to? Are you listening to the voice of God? Or are you listening to the voice that sounds good? See, the thing about God is he don't yell. It always has Bishop this. When is the best time to read your Bible, Bishop? Early in the morning, he's trying to be shy today. But you're supposed to read your Bible early in the morning. Because if you read it in the afternoon, your Facebook, Instagram notification, ding, ding, ding. Your Instagram blowing up, ding, ding, ding. You get messages, ding, ding, ding. Now you got Netflix on. You got Hulu on. You can't focus. Read your Bible early in the morning. Because when you read your Bible early in the morning, now God can speak. And when God speaks, he speaks in a still voice. The Bible says he doesn't scream. He speaks in a still voice. The problem with a lot of us is we don't hear the voice of God. We hear, we hear what we want to hear. And often what we hear are misperceptions, are misperceptions. So run your race. Run your race. Next, turn me to 1 Corinthians 13 and 11. We're almost done. 1 Corinthians 13 and 11. 1 Corinthians 13 and 11. It says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a grown man, I put away childish things. And then it says, for now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know as I am known. And then verse 13 says, and now abide in hope, faith, love, charity. But these three, the greatest amongst them is love. What does that mean? Some of y'all need to grow up. Some of y'all need to grow up. You 18, 19, 20 now. You can't do the same things you did 14, 15, and 13. You are considered an adult. But I'm young. Yes, you are young. The interesting thing about growth is this. There's a difference between growing up and growing old. They're not the same thing. There's a difference between growing up and growing old. See, you can grow old and never have nothing. Or you can grow up and take your life to the next level. You want God to grow you up, not just to grow old. Because if you grow old, you'll just be old but you'll be stuck at the same level. And that's the trap that some of your parents fell into, that some of your cousins fell into, that some of your relatives fell into, because they just got old and never got out of anything. They stayed in the same situation. They never got out of any situation. And the reason why they never grew up is because they were listening to the devil. Remember, Satan says everything he wants to hear. And he says it just how you want to hear it. Hey, you can sell dope for 20 years and be all right. Hey, you can have sex with a whole bunch of girls and be all right. Hey, you can smoke 
weed and you can tattoo and you can sag your pants, but the devil is a liar because everything he tells you has a bad side to it. But see, the thing is, God gives you truth. And the truth will set you free. Not only will it set you free, it will bless you and progress you. Because if you have the truth, now you have a choice. See, when I lie to you, I take away your choice. That's the cold thing about a lie. I remember when I was young and I had to be a player, you know, don't want to be a player no more. One thing, I, I lied to this girl. Now, I had a girlfriend, right? I always had a girl. I've had a girlfriend since 1986. I ain't been single since 1986. Long story short, so I met this girl, right? I'm like, hey, baby, what's up, what's up? So I met this girl. So I got the number, you know, went through, slid in the DM. We didn't have DMs back then, but, you know, whatever that means. I got with the girl. Long story short, she found out that I had a girlfriend. And she told me this. She said, you didn't have to lie. She said, I still would have dated you because I liked you anyway. But she said, because you lied, I won't talk to you anymore. And I was like, whoa, that just blew my mind. I was like 19, 20 years old. I was like 19. But then I thought about it. She was mad at the lie because I took away her choice. And what Satan does, he lies to you. He doesn't give you the truth. Because if you do some of the things that you're doing, and you do them at 20, and next thing you know, you're still doing the same thing at 30, and now you're doing the same thing at 40, eventually you have to pay a price for those things. So the thing is, don't listen to the lies that Satan tells you. Don't listen to the lies that Satan tells you. Last thing, uh, turn with me to Malachi 3 and 8. 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 Malachi 3 and 8 says this. Will a man rob God? And then it says, Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have ye robbed thee? And then God says, In tithes and offerings. The Bible says, Will a man rob God? Now this passage has been used for generations for pastors to raise money for the church. Will a man rob God? Then he put the offering thing out, pay your tithes, pay your tithes. This is an interesting thing. The tithe is one of the few places in the Bible where you can actually test God. The tithe is one of the few places in the Bible where you can actually test God. Now let's read what the rest of this say about this. But we're going to explain what this means in a second. Verse 9. Ye are cursed with the curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bishop, check that first camera. Ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heavens and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room enough to receive it. Verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord of hosts. Verse 12. And all the nations shall call you blessed, for ye are a delightsome land, said the Lord of hosts. All right, let me check all this. All right. There's a thing called the tithe. So you go out and you get a job. Raise your hand if you have a job. Yeah, I have a job. Hey, yeah, all y'all broke. Praise the Lord. Raise your hand if you work. You better raise your. Oh my God. We got, we got to do some more prayer. You might pray for some jobs at the church. Amen. All right. So it's only about 10 of y'all working. Raise your All right. Anyway. So if you're working, the Bible says in Deuteronomy says you cannot work unless God gives you the strength. Is Deuteronomy 8 and 18. God gives you the power to work. You cannot get up in the morning if God don't touch you on the shoulder and wake you up. Everything we do is through the mind of God. Long story short, so you got a job and you go to this place and, and, and they pay you the money. God says, I want you to operate in faith. And if you operate in faith, not only will I bless your money, but I'll bless your health. I'll bless your wealth, I'll bless your future, I'll bless your dreams, I'll cover you from the devil, and when the devil brings your name up, I'll rebuke him for your namesake. 
Now, that is powerful. Because what that means is, if you become a tither, God will bless you 360 degrees. Why am I bringing this up? Recently, we've been having a lot of deaths around here in Compton. Young folks been getting took out, left, robbed, I mean, it's just been crazy. Matter of fact, somebody got shot around the corner from our house last night. I went bike riding at 10.30, they got shot at 10.31. I said, this is murder, Jaheen. I said, this is crazy. Out of control. If you want to rebuke the demon, a cheap way to stay out of trouble is the tithe. But what it also does is it builds faith. Now, a long time ago when I first got married, I've been married 25 years now, my wife was always a tither. I didn't believe in that church stuff. I'm like, man, that's, that ain't giving no man none of my money. You crazy? That's my money. That's what I used to tell her. I was like, you going to give your money to him so he go buy a Cadillac? Cadillac was a big car back in the day. He gonna buy a Cadillac? He gonna buy a Lexus? Not on my money. And my wife would just write her little check and give it. The interesting thing was when I met my wife, she was a clerk. I was a teacher. I made four times the amount of money she made. But I was always broke and she always had money. And I'm like, look, this don't make sense. She made six dollars an hour. I make $24 an hour, yet she always had more money than me. It never made sense to me. Anyway, I got saved. We was married. We've been married since 1994. I got saved. I mean, 1990. I'm messing up here. 1996. About four or five years later, I got saved. So now I'm going to church. So now I started writing my checks and saying, praise the Lord. And ever since then, not only have I been blessed financially, my health has improved. My children were blessed. My home was blessed. If you've been to my house, we got more cars than spaces to park them. I can't fit my motorcycle in the car, but we got two cars, we ain't got enough room. We check the bank account, blessing. Everywhere I go, blessing. I'm like, this is crazy. This church, blessing. I'm like, wow, because of the time. You want God to trust you with your blessing. And it starts on something as small as the tithe. And some of my friends, man, give me my say, keep your money. See, the thing is, Satan is the God of this world. Satan is the God of this world. It's 2 Corinthians 4 and 4. The money that you have in your pocket belongs to him. It was funny. Yesterday, uh, my son Jaheen spent the weekend with us. Long story short, Jaheen has a YouTube channel. So uh, I guess they do videos, and it's really popular now for black kids to show that they got bands and bands, which is a lot of money. So he left on my counter about maybe $1,500 bills. So when I walked downstairs, I saw this big old wad of money. I said, oh my God. I, 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 I promise you, I, I saw the money, I just backed up. I, I, you would have thought somebody had a gun on the brother. I did, whoo. I just backed up. And matter of fact, I went and I covered it up. I said, look, I covered it up and walked away from it. Why did I have that? And here's what's funny. James came over yesterday. And, and James had called me earlier that day talking about something had happened and he needed to borrow a little money. So he came over yesterday. Long story short, when I saw James, I took half that wad of money. I said, hey, James. James was like this. Woo! Almost passed. Why do we have that reaction to money? Because money doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the devil. And because it belongs to the devil, it elicits a certain reaction because he controls it. I didn't feel comfortable around that money until I found it was fake. I promise you, I was like, ooh, ooh I can't have this money. Somebody gonna kill me. I, I just started thinking all kinds of crazy thoughts. So I tell you this for a reason. The devil controls the money. But when you tithe, God protects the money. He removes the curse off the money, and he turns that money that was initially meant to curse you, and he turns it to a blessing. You want God to bless your finances. Because in your life, one of the greatest places that Satan is going to test you is with your money. When he comes for your family, he comes for your money. He, he removed the job. And some of you believe, well, if I don't have a job, I won't survive. 
There's a, a lady named Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa was a, lady, a Mexican lady who lived in Mexico. Long story short, Mother Teresa didn't have five nickels in her pocket. But Mother Teresa traveled on the finest plane. And she ate at the best restaurant. And she traveled all around the world without a job. Because she had the favor of God in her life. So in this life, you want God to approve of you. You want God to be the one to be your savior. You want God to be the one that you make happy, not man. Never try to satisfy men, because if you live to satisfy men, men will come after you. If you live to satisfy God, you will always stay blessed. Everybody stand. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Everybody stand.
No worries. No worries. All right, everybody grab a hand. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for this bounty of you, Father. The fact that you continue to strengthen them, Father, to bless them, Father. We ask, Father, that you deposit your spirit of faith inside of them, Father. Help them, Father, to forget the past and move forward to tomorrow. Reaching towards those things for the mark of the prize and high calling in Jesus Christ. Squeeze the hand next to you. I squeeze life into that hand. I squeeze prosperity into that hand. I squeeze vision and purpose into that hand. That these young people come to hand and not to tell. That they become victorious and never defeated. And that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. No demon, no weapon, nothing that Satan has put before them, Father. We bind the enemy by the precious blood of Jesus. That they will be successful. They will be leaders. They will be teachers, doctors, and business financiers and homeowners. And we claim that in the precious Son of Jesus' name. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Hug somebody. Give somebody a hand clap. Hallelujah. 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 Hall